going to welcome everybody to the virtual Cup of Joe. Uh, this is May 14th, and the conversation today is going to be focused primarily around the FY22 budget, but feel free to ask other questions or make other um, comments and suggestions. So good morning. I'm Brianna Sundard, Communications Manager, joined by your Town Manager, uh, Paul Balkamit, Finance Director, Sean Mangano, and Comptroller, Sonia Aldrich. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So before we get started, uh, usually we give Paul a little chance to, to give a quick update. Um, I'd love to hear from our special guests as well, and then we can kind of launch into questions. Thanks, Brianna. So I'm happy that everybody is able to be here this morning. Uh, we're in the thick of it with the budget. Uh, May is heavy duty budget month, but we meet you know once or twice a week with the finance committee for multiple hours, and we look over um, uh, every department budget, department line by line pretty much uh, by the finance committee. And many times the full town council is there because there's a lot of interest in different aspects of the budget. So that's what we're really in the middle of um, as we move forward. Yeah, and I'll just uh, build on what the town manager said, which is we have a budget hearing on Monday night. Um, so that's a good time to come and uh, share your thoughts with the full, um, it's a finance committee meeting, but I'm sure the full council will be at that mm -hmm. meeting as well. And, and then the next day we ha have an ask me anything, which is sort of a, a initiative where for a certain block of time, people can submit questions. Um, 24 hours, right, Sean? 23, 22, <laughs> uh, we're not gonna- 2 a.m., Sean's gonna answer, answer your question. But, uh, but for a block of time, we're gonna answer questions on a, a forum. And so you can kind of submit any question you want and we're gonna try to get back to you um, in a timely fashion. We also have the Engage Amherst page, which is sort of like a running version of that. So you can kind of do that whenever, um, which Brianna can, maybe can give us more information about in a little bit. So next week's a big week for engagement on the budget. Thank you, Sean. Sonia, anything to add about the FY22 budget before we take questions? No, I think pretty much everything has been said. I'm here as backup and support. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. I know it's early. Um, I want to do a quick reminder to those who are joining us live, both via Zoom and um, via Facebook. So if you're in Zoom, please feel free to raise your hand at any point or pop your question into the Q&A. And for those uh, viewers that I see on Facebook, you can add a comment and I will ask your question. So while we wait for that, uh, there are some questions that have been at been getting asked on our engagement page, which Sean mentioned. Um, you can navigate there from um, our homepage. There's a big panel that says uh, Joy and Engage Amherst, and where you can see projects and initiatives going on in the town. Um, and we have a big budget tile that you can go there, view the actual budget, uh, view our companion piece story that we did this year, and see what questions are being asked, look at the FAQ. So that's a great place to start if you wanted to start digging into the, the budget. So one question that we have here is how have federal funds related to COVID affected this budget? Sean, Sean's, Sean's the guru on the, uh, our local federal funds. Yeah, I can start with that one. I, so sort of two ways. Um, so we have two buckets of federal money that will primarily affect the town operations. And then there's a third bucket of federal money that will affect the, the school operations. Um, so CARES, which was really the first big federal pot of money, um, that has allowed the town to not have to worry about any additional budget for things related to COVID. That's been able to cover any of our um, necessary costs that have exceeded our budgets anywhere. So that program runs through the end of uh, 2021. So at least the first half of FY22 will still have access to CARES money for any additional costs related to COVID. Um, the new pot of money that we'll be getting sometime in May or June is the American Rescue Plan Act. And that program is more focused on economic recovery. It can still help with CARES related co or COVID related costs, but a lot of the eligible uses are around economic recovery and sort of fixing the damage that was done by, um, by COVID. And so for that group of uh, pot of money, we've had, we have some ideas that we put in the budget document about ways to spend it. Um, but we're going to be uh, getting together as a group and, and form, formulating a process for how that money gets allocated. And then sort of related to both of those pots of money, but it just flows through, um, through a different avenue, are ESSER funds um, that go to the schools. 
And so I think there was some CARES money that went through and became ESSER funds. And there's some of this new American Rescue Plan money that's flowing through and will become ESSER funds. And those funds go directly to the schools um, and can be used for a variety of different purposes, mostly um, similar to us. They, they have to be related to COVID, um, but the schools are coming up with a plan for how to use those funds. Great, thank you, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if anybody has a question about that in the crowd, please um, pop it into the Q&A or raise your hand. I do see that we have Council President Griesmer on the call today, so I will invite her at any point she wants to um, come in and ask a question or make a statement, just raise your hand and we'll invite you in. So open invite there. Another question we had here is um, relating to the four building projects, something that's you know been in conversation in, in town for quite some time. So is, is the plan to address the four building projects reflected in this FY22 budget? Yeah, so um, it's, it's reflected in a couple different places. So uh, the capital improvement program, that plan is within the five-year plan. Um, so if you pull that document up, you'll see that in the out years, we are projecting increases in our, our debt service payments um, for the four building projects, the fire station, the DPW, the library, and the, and the schools. Um, and we do that because we want to, you know, we're constantly looking out five years to make sure that we're on the right track, that we're not going to hit any surprises along the way. And that the analysis we've done so far is, is still on track, um, which it seems to be. In the FY22 budget document itself, there's also a five-year projection of the actual budget, the full budget. And the key part there is that when we project out five years, we're projecting how, how much funding is going to go to capital. And so to do the four building projects the way that we previously um, presented, we need to get to a certain level of funding for capital, which is about 10.5% of our, our tax levy. And so that assumption has been built into that five-year plan around the overall budget. Um, and again, we're, we're looking at the bottom line to make sure there's no surprises, that there's not any huge deficits, that we can continue to um, invest in our operating budgets um, and things of that nature. So, so we've been graded in a couple of different ways. And, and those are the things we kind of update every year to make sure we don't see any surprises coming up. Yeah, and I'd just like to add, you know, just to take a step back is how people can access the budget. It can be pretty intimidating to look at a municipal budget. But if you go to our uh, upcoming budget page, all the documents are in one site and you can go through the Engage Amherst uh, page, which is sort of the, the most user friendly, but there are two basic documents. One is the operating budget, which is the funds that we, we use to pay salaries and all that. That's a pretty large document, 200, almost 300 pages long. But the first 15, 17 pages are sort of gives you a nice little uh, summary of what's in that. The other document is the capital plan, which is the, um, the capital, not the ongoing budget items that we have. And that's a relatively small document, you know, 20, 30 pages, something like that. But it, it lists not only all the things that we intend to buy with a little um, paragraph on each thing that we intend to buy this year, um, but also a five-year capital plan and an inventory of everything we own. So we're building that document up over time as well. So if you looking at those two things, you can look at how we're allocating funds by department um, and by activity. Can you guys talk a little bit more about how, what new things you've done with the budget in terms of presentation this year? I know we touched a little bit on some of those things, but why, why did you decide to kind of take some new tactics here and, and, and update because that? Because we're crazy. <laughs> we had it down, we did it down like a science and then it was like, but we can make it better. Yeah, there's sort of a, there's sort of a couple of things we, um, we try to do one. One is there was a lot of um, behind the scenes work with the, the previous budget. Um, there were many different documents. It took a lot of sort of not analytical work, but sort of um, just time consuming work to stitch it all together. And whenever there was a change, it had to be done again. Um, and so one reason we changed it up a little bit was to kind of streamline it and get it all in one place so that it was easier to make these updates. Um, the second piece is we wanted to make sure that our budget aligned with um, sort of the best practices that are put forward by the uh, Governmental Finance Officers Association. They have a, a rubric of these different sections that every budget should have or, or what they view as sort of best practices for every budget. 
And so we took that checklist and we sort of went through what we had, which we had a very, the town had a very strong budget and still um, before it was not like there was major things lacking. It was very good. Um, but we looked at the areas that we could add to that. And, and then we tried to also incorporate some, some pictures, some things to make the budget a little bit more engaging. Um, and so th that's sort of how we got to where we are is we tried, added a few things to, to make it fully aligned with best practices. And then we added some more engaging photos and charts and things like that. But in a lot of ways, it's the core of it is the same as it's always been. Um, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, just I mean for all for the staff for the finance staff, you know, Sean and Sonia and, and Holly who put a lot of work into it. Doing something new for the first time is really challenging, and uh, getting in a lot of new pieces in place. I know Brianna, you contributed a lot to making this um, document the way it is now. I think it, it will over you know in the future it'll be a lot easier for us to manage through and put together. Um, but this first year, I think we learned a lot. And um, so I just kudos to everybody who's put so much time into making this and getting it to the to the deadline, which, which we did. <laughs> yeah. And then the other the other piece of um, the other piece of the, the new stuff this year was around the engagement. And so we did two new things this year with a lot of help from Brianna um, leading the process, which is the, the engage Amherst page, which we talked about a little bit. Um, which is a, a nice central hub where you can ask questions and link to the documents and, and find out more information, um, which I, that I envision we'll, we'll keep doing going forward because it's, it's a nice user-friendly way to, to interact. And then the second piece is the sort of story map of the budget. If, for those who watch the budget presentation, um, that's one area where we want to, we can probably refine and think about how much time we have and um, because there's a lot of information in there, mm -hmm. but it's a really nice, it's a really nice document for people who want to go through the budget on their own and have more time than we had when we presented um, to kind of go through, you know, the different themes of the budget, what's being done in the budget, um, what, what's happened related to COVID. Um, it's a, it's a very easy to navigate clickable document where you can see, get a lot of information um, and you don't have to go through the, you know, 300 pages of the budget document, you can kind of get it condensed in a, in a short amount of time. So those, those are the two new things we did, which I thought were pretty good. And again, we'll, we've learned a little bit this year of ways we can even make it better going forward. So, you know, one of the things about the story map and Brianna, you can weigh in on this. One of the things that I found interesting about it is that um, a lot of people are accessing things through their phone or through their tablet. And it's, it's just, you just scroll through it. It's not like a PowerPoint where you have to click to the next thing. You just scroll and scroll and you can hear that it's just, you can read the whole story of the budget um, by just going through your phone. And, and so we're finding more and more people, and Brianna knows these numbers more than I, about who are accessing the website and the budget through their, their mobile devices. And so that was one of the initiatives is to say, well, let's get to where people actually are versus making them go through our normal website. That's the logic, right, Brianna? Yeah, absolutely. I think really what we need to do is ha not just have one new way is kind of maintain the way that it's working for some people and kind of add on. And I think that's what the budget story was a, a little bit of a companion piece. And because it's mobile responsive and more than half of the people who access our website are using a, a, a smartphone, we really decided that that might be a, a nice journey for them rather than kind of looking through um, a PDF on their phone is not as, is not as a uh, good of an experience. So, mm -hmm. so I want to remind the folks in the room, we, this is um, intended to be, you know, community chat. We do want to hear from you. Um, I do see a handful of you in our zoom room, as well as some live on Facebook. So please feel free to raise your hand or put a question into the Q and A. We'd love to hear from you. It's early. I know. <laughs> Oh, there we go. I am going to invite Ken to unmute and introduce. Good morning and thank you. I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live on Sunset Avenue. Uh, and I wanna say first, we are very fortunate to have you, Paul and Sean and your team in town hall worrying about our finances in this very, very difficult couple of years. Um, you, you are terrific in normal times and to be able to respond to the unpredictable stuff that's been imposed upon all of us individually in the town through the pandemic and the consequences, you've just been great. And you're making it easy. Uh, one of the consequences of making it easy to understand this is you're gonna make it easy for us to comment and to get comments from um, would-be critics like me who have things to say. 
And having said that, my question has nothing to do with the budget, but it has to do with the um, plans for redoing the uh, North Common in town and only with one area that concerns me and that is the seven parking spaces that are back in parking spaces off of Main Street. Are they still in the, in the plan, Paul? Yeah, so the, the uh, town council is going to be having a public hearing on that as well, uh, on the actual parking part of it. They've pretty much decided how they want the North Common to look, and now they're looking at the parking options. Um, and it, they they right now is is designed to have back end parking, um, which is sort of the new standard coming forward. And, and I know that that's and, and the logic and why is back end parking. It's because it makes it safer for motorists and um, bicyclists when you pull out, you're pulling out, not, you're not backing into traffic, you're pulling into traffic. Um, and so those, those are still there because that um, almost doubles the number of spaces that we can fit into that space. And we're trying to uh, ample, you know, have as many parking spaces as we can to replace the ones that are being um, removed. Well, then I would just like to say this, uh, I am very worried about safety with back-end parking mm -hmm. for this reason. Uh, at, at, when the light changes and people come from Amity and go down Main Street, or when they make the right turn from South Pleasant onto Main, they're accelerating and they're, they, uh, they will encounter the people who are suddenly deciding to slow down, mm -hmm. stop and back mm -hmm. up. Uh, I, I, I only, I, I don't know the solution to this, but I offer one possible way to investigate it. I wonder if, if you could, um, with uh, Guilford Mooring, on some weekend when the school parking lots, the biggest school parking lot you know is, is totally empty, mm -hmm. mark out the spaces and practice having some cars uh, come down what is the equivalent of a main street and while others are trying to back in. I, I think it's an accident waiting to happen because mm -hmm. not everybody is gonna be as good a driver as we wish. You got old people mm -hmm. like me, um, who suddenly decide they want to park back up and backing up into parking spaces is always hard. So you, you back up, you miss the line, you pull out again and try to back up a second time. You watch this happen on, on the Spring Street uh, area where, where there aren't a lot of fast cars and you still see problems. Mm -hmm. So I just raise that as, as a worrisome thing and I hope you look at it very hard. And, Absolutely. And no, I think that's a, those, yeah, those are really good concerns, Ken. And I think you're right. I mean, people are, are less comfortable backing into parking spaces than they are to pulling in. And then, um, you, know, you know, I think there are some examples, but Northampton has pull-in parking like you are recommending that you're suggesting um, still. Um, but there are other places have, who've done the back-end parking, but that's a, um, it's a conversation. And it, it, in terms of the orientation, it's just a matter of which way the parking spaces are angled. It really doesn't make a difference in the number of parking spaces by that decision. Well, one more comment and then I'll shut up and give another chance. I'm worried about even pull-in parking spaces there because then to exit the parking, you're backing up into traffic again. Uh, it's seven spaces. I know that there are some people in town who, who value the loss of a single space, but and it would be great to be able to have parking right close to the middle of town. And to lose seven is a problem for some stores but I think the safety comes first. And just to avoid mm -hmm. one accident over a few years, it, it, it's, it's worth thinking about again. Yeah. And, and thank, thank, thank you again for listening and thank you for what you're doing with the budget to make it understandable to people like me. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Those are, those are valuable comments, Ken, so thank you. Thank you, Ken. And that public hearing is um, two Mondays from now in case you wanted to tune into that. Uh, Monday the 24th. We also have a, a project page on Engage Amherst for the North Common Revitalization Project that, that kind of outlines the different concepts, the design concepts, and invites um, some, some engagement as well. So feel free to check that out. So I do see a hand um, with, there's not a name, but it's 1364. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute and introduce yourself. It's Phyllis Lehrer from South Amherst. I always follow Ken, so I have to keep up the pattern. <laughs> uh, mine is sort of a corollary to his. Again, with the decrease in parking and the changes in all these, how much revenue are we losing from all this? And it's a modest amount, obviously, but how is the parking revenue going? 
um, parking revenue, and this is Sony. Sony, why don't you talk, chime in on our, our parking revenue? It is a problem, Phyllis. You've identified an important piece. Um, yeah, it, we're about fifty, not even up to fifty percent collected at this point in time in the fiscal wow. year. So we've taken a big hit with parking through COVID. And that's because of parking revenue and tickets, not ticket right, sales. Right. Um, <laughs> Tickets. Tickets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. then also to follow up on that are we making more money on the tickets that we issue to the uh late night party people with all their uh noise etc cetera, etc cetera? is that making us more money <laughs> i haven't seen that um <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if there's more of that. There's probably a consistent level of that. Yeah, that, that's actually been a, an interesting um, development is that there have been very few large parties, very few tickets. I mean, we read about the tickets when they're issued. You read about it in the in the bulletin, but there haven't you know there haven't been those big parties. And part of it is, I mean, just COVID and people are a higher um, understanding of the the dangers of COVID among university students primarily. Um, but also the weather's been pretty crappy on weekends. So there haven't been these big um, gatherings on weekends during most of the year. Uh, we still have, you know, uh, so there haven't been as many tickets as in previous years, actually, for those those events. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate all that you're doing. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you, Phyllis. Always good to hear from you. Okay. So some of the questions that we kind of had in the in the hopper here, um, we talked a little, you talked a little bit about what's next and some upcoming dates. Can you kind of walk people through what the timeline is from where we are now to what the final kind of end result will be and how they can be involved in that process? Yes. Um, so the, uh, we, as I said before, we have the budget hearing on the 17th, um, which is a great opportunity to get involved and, and come submit your comments. Um, we have the Ask Me Anything on the 18th, which will be a, a push out of how to submit a question on that as well. Um, and then we have the Engage Amherst page, which is ongoing, um, that you can visit and submit a question at any time. And the nice thing about the, the Engage Amherst page is if you submit a question, it go it e sends an email directly to the people that are listed on that page, which right now are Brianna and and, and then we can respond to it. And when we respond to it, it will post the response on that page and keep a running list of all those questions and answers. But it will also send an email to the person who, who asked the question, right, Brianna? And it'll, and it'll give that answer directly to them. So it's a really um, user-friendly tool. Uh, we have a number of finance committee meetings still to come. We have, um, I think it's the, on the 18th and the 20th, we have finance committee meetings where we will be talking about um, enterprise funds on the DPW on the 18th. And then on the 20th, we will be talking about general government, which are all the different departments here at town hall. And then we have another finance committee meeting on the 27th, where we will be talking about conservation and development. And then we will also be talking about the community responder program in more detail at that meeting. And then the following week, I think I don't have a calendar in front of me. I think it's the first and the third um, is when the finance committee is going to start working on their recommendation based on everything they've heard. Um, and hopefully we'll have a recommendation by the third that they'll give to council. Um, and then once their recommendation, it will go to the council um, for consideration and the council will vote on it. Um, I, the, our calendar is posted on the, our upcoming budget page. So that's, that'll have June, the date June 21st, date. right? That the date that it's on there for our okay. vote. Yeah. But so technically it's on there for June 21st, assuming there's no hiccups or, or any issues um, to be voted. And once it's voted, then, then the, um, you know, the budget will go into effect on July 1st. So really at any of those meetings, um, you can give public comment, you can email your counselor, um, you can email the town manager, there's, um, um, you can email myself, there's lots of ways to, to submit your feedback and input on the budget. Um, and that stuff really matters. We, when we read that stuff, um, we, you know, we think about how we can address that in the budget or factor it in the next time around. Um, it is really important to submit your comments on it. So I see Council President Lynn Griesmer's hand. So I'd love to invite Lynn in to the room if you could unmute. Hi, Lynn. Good morning. Good morning, all. Um, morning, Lynn. Wanted to add to uh, Sean's 
um, calendar, and that is actually on the evening of the 27th at 5.30 is when we're going to be focusing on the community safety working group and the proposal for the community responder program that is in this year's budget as a starting point. Okay. Excellent, thank you, Lynn. I think that I think Lynn did a wise thing because is and we're because there's a lot of attention on this piece of the budget and a lot of um, people interested in it. Uh, and usually the finance committee meets uh, at, in the afternoon. That's been what, what their practice has been. But she, uh, she and the uh, finance committee chair Andy Steinberg felt this was an important enough topic that it, it's all important. But this one um, would be better suited for the public to have it later in the day or early in the evening, so people more people can access that the opportunity to engage with that meeting. Anything else you wanted to add, Lynn, to the to the budget conversation? While we have you, mosquitoes. No, I, I mosquitoes, just say, Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate the new budget format. Uh, it's actually made paper useless <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, because it's so much more uh, user friendly when you're um, using it online, and it's um, very very well put together. So thank you all. Hey, hey Lynn. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about mosquitoes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> but yes. Um, so uh, we actually are moving forward. Uh, the Board of Health met yesterday. They have recommended to the town council 5-0 as their vote that we join the Pioneer Mosquito. Um, I'm not sure if I have the full name, but it's a, a group of other communities in our area who only who have a developed plan already that does not use spray um, in general, but only if there is an emergency. And so that will come before the council on Monday. We will have public comment during that time specific to mosquito spray. And uh, we'll have a full description of the plan that this collaborative of municipalities use. So. I think so, we're toward a resolution. Yeah, so, so the reason that's a, an interesting topic is that th there's a new state law that said, um, if you don't want us to, if the state's saying, if you don't want us to have the option of spraying in your town, you have to opt out by May 15th. And every, it just sort of snuck up on towns, cities and towns, and everybody was going crazy, every community. And so uh, the state came back and because of the, the sort of blowback they received, they said, well, now you have until May 28th. And there are certain rules you have to follow. You have to get the advice of your, your board of health and then the council or makes that decision. Um, and so this gives us the time to make actually an, an informed, they have the council make an informed decision based on advice from the board of health. Um, I think the um, council received a lot of feedback from folks saying, we don't want aerial spraying here. Um, and I think that's that was, um, some of the, co the comments that the Board of Health heard as well, but they also understand that there is a role <clears throat> in the public health world for trying to control the spread of mosquitoes because there are a lot of mosquito-borne illnesses that can be really that are deadly, a triple E virus, for instance. We don't have much of that in this section of the state. There was one uh, incident of aerial spraying last year in the state, and that was in Plymouth County. Um, but you know the fact that they could cost a lot of people concern, so that's why the council is responding in this way and considering this proposal by the board of health. But it did generate a lot of a lot of comments, right, Lynn? Absolutely, yeah. and we wanted to. It actually, I just want to be very, very um, understanding of how this caught so many communities off guard. So many of these communities, this information would come through the Board of Health and through the Director of Health. Well, they've been a little busy making sure people got <laughs> And so I, uh, you know, the fact that they didn't uh, jump on this, uh, we are not alone in this call. And we want to thank uh, Senator Comerford and uh, Mindy Dom for uh, helping to get the extension that we were all given. Yes, absolutely. Great, thank you for that update, Lynn. 
Okay, so again, I'm going to do another call for folks who are in the room to feel free to raise your hand or put your question into the Q&A. Um, I have another question here that was pre-submitted. Um, what are some of the major investments in this budget proposal? Yeah, I can start with that. So I think one thing to start with is that um, this was a, a good budget in a lot of ways that, that we're projecting our revenues um, to bounce back a little bit. But there really wasn't a lot added in this budget. Um, we are really just getting back to where we were pre-pandemic. And I think there's a little bit of a, a disconnect because it, it feels good because our revenues are going up and then we feel like we're starting to come out of it. But we're still we're still feeling the impacts of COVID. And so I think the first thing is that there really wasn't a lot added in the budget. We were able to maintain a lot of what we had and we were able to restore a little bit of what was um, of what was reduced in the in the prior year's budget. Um, but but it was really about getting back to where we are. Um, so I think one of the major investments was we're getting back on track with capital spending. Um, we had cut capital spending from 10% uh, of the tax levy down to about half of that for FY21. And so for FY22, we're getting back up to eight and a half percent. And um, our goal is 10% um, or even a little bit higher. And so that's really important for the town. We, we get a lot of comments about the condition of the various buildings that are you know, projected to be replaced or, or even other buildings that just need to be maintained. Um, and so that number that we put towards capital directly relates to how well we can do those things. Um, we, in the budget, as, as we've talked about a little bit, we reallocated some funding from the police department down to social services to help start this community responder program. Um, so that's one of the one of the new things that we'll be um, working on in the coming year. Uh, we have taken an existing position that's within the within our budget already, and we are proposing to combine that with some of the American Rescue Plan funds to add a diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator um, to focus on a number of initiatives. One, um, you know, helping recruit more diverse staff for town hall. Um, you know, reviewing our policies and procedures to, to try to eliminate bias as much as possible. Um, so that's another initiative we're working on. Uh, again, a lot of it was around restoring things that were cut. We were, uh, there were a lot of reductions in the recreation department um, in FY21 because we was, weren't sure what type of activities the recreation department could do. Um, so two areas that were, were reduced in FY21 were um, Cherry Hill staffing um, temporary staffing and uh, pool part-time help. And so those are two areas that um, the pool part-time help, we restored that all the way um, in our budget for FY21 or for FY22. And the Cherry Hill um, temporary staffing, we're proposing to use American Rescue Plan money to bring that back up to where it was before. And that's another one that will phase into our general, our, our operating budget in the coming years. Um, again, the American Rescue Plan funds are really about Part of it is about, you know, helping address the impacts of revenues that you've lost because of the pandemic. And so that's one of the areas that um, was impacted. Um, i trying to think if there's anything else. Anything else? I, I, I mean, I think the big, the big ticket item, if you're talking, it was the capital. Uh, we had really pulled back on capital last year to help with the budget. Um, and we didn't purchase hardly anything. And so now there is a backlog of need. So we're getting closer to where we should have been a year ago. We're, it's gonna take us a few years to get that totally back up and running. Um, but there are a lot of things that need to be addressed and that's where uh, the bulk of the new money um, is going to go to is, is the capital. For instance, we didn't buy any vehicles last year. Um, and that's usually, that's very unusual for a, an operation this size to not buy any cruisers or anything like that. So. Yeah, I think one thing I failed to mention that I think we are excited about is um, um, a couple of things. One is within that capital allocation going up to eight and a half percent, one of the things we were able to do was um, dedicate $100,000 for sustainability improvements. Mm -hmm. And we've we've heard a number of potential projects that that money would go towards. Um, and so, you know, and, and that's an item that we have imagined will be a recurring uh, investment every year within the capital plan. Um, to continue making progress and, and lowering our, our energy consumption. Um, similar, we also added 50,000 for accessibility improvements in town, um, which we also envision will be an ongoing item going forward. We just had an accessibility study done recently that listed a whole bunch of areas where we could make improvements. Um, 
And so that money will go to start chipping away at that list in a meaningful way. Um, so on the capital front, we are doing some exciting new things um, that should have benefits throughout town in the coming years. Great, I see some new people have joined. So feel free to ask your question uh, via Q&A or raise your hand. We'd love to hear from you. So just a quick reminder on that front. What else do you think that's in this budget that might surprise people that you haven't mentioned or talked about yet? Or is it more kind of business as usual besides some of the things you've highlighted? I think people have to recognize, or I hope people will help to understand that the um, COVID had a significant impact on our budget. We tried to maintain services as best we could, but our revenues, especially the non-tax revenues, meaning water and sewer rates, transportation, all the enterprise funds for the most part, really took a, took a hit. Um, water and sewer, uh, because our biggest users are the university and Amherst College, and they had depopulated, and so they weren't using much water anymore. And even when they came back, they were at a lower capacity. So though our costs did not go down for water or sewer because we still have to maintain all that infrastructure, which is built to service these large populations, but the populations weren't there to, to purchase the water. So those... Um, those enterprise funds, and they they are a business in, to, in and of themselves. They have to um, keep reserves and pay all their expenses and pay for the, the costs of the, to operate, including their pension liabilities and things like that. They have ongoing expenses that they had to meet. And so those those were really hurt badly. Um, and they will take, a, take several years to recover. Um, and there's a plan for that. It's not going to all happen in one year um, and rates we're in a fortunate position in that our rates for water and sewer are really low compared to our neighboring communities and below the statewide average. So, um, you know, we don't like raising rates unless we have to, um, but in order to sustain our operations. And there's the operations are getting more and more um, complex and demanding in terms of uh, environmental requirements, which are a good thing, but they still um, require an allocation of funds to meet those needs. Anything else on enterprise funds, Sonia, you think? No, it's, it was basically the rates. They took a big hit on yeah. revenues. And on the general fund, it was mostly um, licenses and permits. Oh, right. And um, some of the interfund transfers, the indirect costs, because the enterprise funds did so bad, we couldn't take some of the indirect costs that they normally pay the general fund, mm -hmm. which we ended up with about a $450,000 revenue deficit. But fortunately, we had enough surplus in the operating budget that got returned that offset that, and then some. All right, I don't see any hands currently in the room or on our Facebook stream. Um, oh, here we go. We've got something that got popped into the Q&A. Uh, so this is from Tony. We saw in the Gazette today that UMass is going to receive 50 million from the American Rescue Plan. What estimates have you received from monies expected to come to the elementary and regional schools? So um, I can answer that a little bit. I'm not going to be exact. Um, I, I think of you know one thing we can post out is more information on this because I know it's a, a area of high interest for some people. Um, I believe in the latest round of money. Again, there's a bunch of these. There's SR one, SR two, SR three. And believe, those are all the school, those are all the school pots of money, right? Those are all monies that go directly to the schools. Um, I believe in the latest round, SR three, both each individually, each school is supposed to get um, each school district is supposed to get somewhere around two million dollars in ESSER three money, um, but we will put out more specific information. I will say that I don't think they have an exact number yet. Um, I think that's still sort of an estimate. And, and even our number at the town, you know, the town was projected to get over um, $10 million in, in American Rescue Plan funds. Um, but I was on a webinar the other day that those numbers still aren't finalized. We'll get finalized numbers in the, in the, in the next week or so. Um, and, and just to clarify, that $10 million is a three-year number, right? right? Yep. Yeah, I don't know what the timeline is for the ESSER money. All these, you know, so this has been a, um, 
the last year has been a uh, challenging grant management uh, project because we, mm-hmm. the state is giving plenty of money for, or not the state, the federal government is, is pushing out all this money for different purposes, but it's coming in these different buckets and different timelines and slightly different uses. And so it's really been a little bit of a balancing act to make sure that we use, we want to use the money that expires the earliest first. And so we've had to have a lot of conversations with the schools about when their grants expire, when our grants exp- um, end dates are, and to make sure that we're charging the right grant because we don't, you know, we want to minimize any money that um, potentially could go back. And so it's been a, a balancing act from that standpoint. Um, Can we just jump in here because it, also people should under all the, the, the amount of correspondence that goes be, uh, back and forth between the state and Sean's office. Is this an eligible expense? Because we have all kinds of things we'd like to put on this and they will say yes or no, but it's every expense has to be submitted and said, will you pay for this if we submit it? And because we don't want to buy something or, or purchase something and then have the have the CARES Act or whatever not cover it because then that someone's got to pay for it. So there's a lot of, um, even before we purchase or take, it, take on an activity, there's a lot of back and forth with the state seeking permission to use the funds in a certain way because they're ultimately the ones sending us the check. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the real bottleneck in all of this has been FEMA. So for a lot, um, for mm-hmm. CARES in particular, anything that we charge to CARES that the, um, the state deems potentially FEMA eligible, we have to submit to FEMA first. And all the rules for everything has been changing. FEMA has changed their rules about what's eligible and what's not eligible several times. Um, CARES has updated their eligibility guidelines several times. And so it's been a little bit of a moving target, but we submitted a FEMA application back in June of 2020. And we have just recently got a little bit more um, information on what of that application they're gonna reimburse. And we're almost a year after that. Um, and so the, the major implication that ha- has is that until we know what FEMA is going to reimburse, we don't know how much is going to go on to CARES <laughs> or how much CARES is going to have to pay. Um, and so it is a it is a challenge that um, both the town and the schools and all the towns, because I've talked to some of my colleagues, um, have had is, is how to maximize all these grant funds. And so you, we, you have a little sympathy for FEMA because they've they're used to dealing like one county that's had a hurricane or a disaster. Now they have 20,000 communities who are all having a disaster and we're all submitting our claims all at the same time. And they have, they have no capacity to ramp up and they've done a pretty remarkable job under the circumstances. Um, but it's you know, you just imagine, and the, and the Congress is allocating trillions of dollars uh, and they're trying to manage all that. So it's, it's an unusual time, I have to say. Can we bring up something else, Brianna? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, okay. so we we did, um, we had made a presentation to Standard and Poor's um, last week about our bond rating. That's an important thing. This is this is a short term rating. It's only for the next two years. We're not doing substantial borrowing in the next couple of years. But I just want to compliment uh, Sean and Sonia and. Um, Sherry Boucher and Jen LaFountain and the entire sort of um, finance team for putting together a pretty remarkable presentation to Standard & Poor's uh, under these sort of dire financial conditions. We were um, hoping to hold on to our uh, credit rating. So I have not seen the final release yet, but um, so I think that that's, that's, that's our, that was our goal. And one of our goals, um, we were obviously hoping for an upgrade if we could get it, but we understood that the situation is such. Um, but, you know, I think we made a very strong case for the, our budgetary controls. So they look at different factors. They look at how you run your town, the financial um, controls you have in place. Are you, are you good at budgeting? Are you good at planning? Um, are you good at delivering on what your budget says? Uh, then they also look at the broader economic outlook for the town. And then they also look at the broader out, economic outlet for the state, outlook for the state. And then they put all that together and they put a rating on it so that when people are buying bonds, they have a level of confidence. And they do this nationwide because they're comparing us to every other city and town in the nation when they when they do these ratings. Um, but it was it was a, um, a in the middle of the entire budget, <laughs> we decided to go get a bond rating upgrade. And so um, so it was a good it was. Um, is a pretty strong uh, presentation. We learned a lot from doing the presentation as well. And 
Sonia or Sean, you want to add anything on that? Yeah, yeah, I think we did. Um, you may not have seen it. Um, I think we did get the final um, rating affirming our double A plus um, score. And again, that has a real, it's it's a really positive thing. It has a real impact on our borrowing costs when we go out to um, issue bonds or bond anticipation notes. That's what lenders look at to determine how safe we are of a of a investment or of a um, to lend money to. And so to, to maintain that rate, which is you know this, sort of the second from the highest you can have um, is a really positive thing. And, and we'll, you know, we have heard whether we do all four building projects or not, you know, we will be doing a, probably a significant level of borrowing in the coming years. And so having that rating is good for um, keeping our borrowing costs down. I do see um, Council President Lynn Griesmer's hand. So Lynn, feel free to unmute and come on in. Yeah, I, uh, Sean and Paul, I think it would be really useful, uh, Sonia, please, uh, really useful to explain the two factors that basically prevent us from going higher, because there are areas, frankly, that we have no control over, and uh, we want to make sure that people understand that for a town that is we as well managed as we are, uh, this is an outstanding rating, uh, but there are two factors that kind of are out there, please. Yeah. Um, so there's, yeah, there's sort of two buckets. Um, one is the, what they call the, uh, it's related to our economy, the local economy, and they look at the sort of economic buying power uh, per person. And so they look at a town like Amherst and, um, and they come up with sort of a, a figure per person. And what keeps Amherst a little bit lower than what we would need to be to be the highest score um, is uh, we have a lot of college students for one thing that don't have a lot of uh, reported income. And so that sort of drives our number down. And then there's some other factors um, that just keep our number from being where we need to be. And, and so this is related directly to sort of the, the personal income of, of people that live in Amherst um, as yeah, divided so, so, by, a, by a bigger number. Yeah, so what they like are a, a rich community like a Weston or something, or, or even, not even rich, but just, a community that has a very large, a large number of people with a decent income, and our numbers don't support that. Uh, just and there's nothing we can do about that because of the large student population who report very little income. We've tried to make the argument to them that those, it, you can't look at just the student income, but you also look at their family income and tried to um, argue some strong points on that. Um, but they, you know, the Standard and Poor's is a, is a very metrics-driven organization. They look at the numbers. Um, according to their, their formulas, and they sort of apply those numbers to our situation. And there's not a whole lot we can do about that piece of it. Right. Yeah. I mean, they, they give us, they give us extra points for, for having a large stabilized institution, like the college and the colleges and universities, which is really positive for us. Um, they recognize all the sort of economic development that's been going on in town. Um, but it, it, in the end of the day, it boils down to some key metrics. And if those metrics aren't at a certain place and, and those are just data that we can't control, um, it, it sort of prevents us from getting to where we might wanna be at, from a rating perspective. I think, I think it's sometimes the rating is maybe not as important as what the town is trying to do. Um, you know, there may be a, a more important issue that the town is trying to do that you can't just focus on the rating. Um, and so the other bucket that, uh, that we have a metric that we're, we're trying to work on is our uh, o, uh, pension and OPEB, other post-employment benefits uh, cost. They look at that as a percentage of your, your overall budget. And so uh, many communities struggle in this area because other post-employment benefits um, is, a, is a big number that came on relatively recently in the last 10 or 15 years that really became a, a high focus. And many communities have a really high liability um, for that. And so Amherst is doing very well at trying to fund that liability, but, um, but from an S&P perspective, they still view the liability as really large and, and they want towns and communities to do more than what we're currently doing. Um, and then on another, on the pension side, uh, where our pension system is projected to be fully funded by around 2033, 2034, which is pretty good. That's, you know, that's getting pretty close. It's not that far away. Um, However, S&P doesn't uh, agree with some of the assumptions that Massachusetts pension systems use. Um, they think that they may be using overly optimistic assumptions, which 
I think is a debatable topic. Um, but that's another area where they where we kind of were docked a little bit because because of that, the, the assumptions that are used. I don't know if they think that we'll be funded by 2033. Um, so again, there's there's a couple of factors that are really outside the control of what we can do here, but on all the things that we can control, budgeting, planning, um, we, we scored really high. And so we're, we're proud of that. All right, great question, Lynn, thank you. Anybody else in the room? Uh, we're, we're wrapping up and are getting close to our hour. So uh, last chance to, to ask a question or comment, um, budget related or not. I don't see any hands um, or questions coming in the room. So is there anything you, you guys wanna leave people with that didn't get discussed yet? Um, while we give people a moment or two to ask a last question. Um. You know, this is the traditional end of the academic year. We have UMass graduation today, you know, yesterday, today, tomorrow is sort of an extended time frame for it. Um, Hampshire has their graduation this weekend too, I think. Um, Amherst College is uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, so that's the traditional end of the academic year. And then we move into our summer, um, summertime. And it just, you know, it, it, hopefully with the, um, uh, Vaccines getting pushed out. We're really excited about the number of people we've been able to vaccinate and credit to the health department for making that such a success. Um, we're feeling like we're, we're starting to emerge and I think everybody's feeling that way. Um, so over the next you know two to three months, um, I think we'll be in a much better place than we have been in the past year. Yeah, and um, sort of related to that, Paul, maybe you can give an update. One of the things I think is really exciting are these three projects, the North Amherst Library, the mm -hmm. Amaray Intersection, the Common. Um, what are the timelines for those to be completed? Because those are all things that are going to kind of give a facelift um, and, and make Amherst a better place. What is, um, what's the timeline on that? So the North Amherst Library is, that's the one that's been, uh, there's been an anonymous donor has been supporting that. Uh, we're moving into construction documents. So we're hoping that that could actually get underway in, uh, in the fall. Uh, with it and uh, pretty aggressive construction schedule. So that, that is moving very quickly. Um, Pomeroy Village, we also have funds in place. Um, the council is, is um, reviewing that as well in terms of, and the basic question is, do we want a, a signalized intersection or do we want a, uh, a roundabout at that location? And um, there's been a recommendation made by one of the council committees to the council. Once they make that decision, We'll be getting doing more of the engineering plans, and that takes some time. That's that's probably about a uh, nine month engineering process um, to get all the surveys done, to um, get the traffic counts done. We're doing traffic counts up there right now, um, things like that. Um, and then we hope that that project will get started. We have uh, next year, and then um, the North Common. Uh, we're hopeful, we're again, looking at additional funds to uh, support some of the work that's going on around the common from Congressman McGovern. Um, and the council again has to take one more action on that and we'll start working on the plans for that. So those, those aren't gonna be shovel in the ground. Typically for like the North Common project, we would try to start that probably next May if we can get there because that's the time when there's less demand on parking in that area. Okay, I don't see any hands in the room or any questions in the in the Q and A box. So, um, Sean, Sonia, any any last words? No, thank you. Said for it all. Having us. I will say that I started last May, and I feel gypped by these cup of joes because <laughs> I, I understood that Paul would buy coffee for these things, and that hasn't happened yet. So, um, I'm looking forward to the first one that I actually get coffee. I'll get you two cups then. That's right. <laughs> All right, well, I wanna thank uh, both of you for joining us today and everybody who joined us live. Uh, we will be posting this up on our channel shortly. And if you have any questions or want to dig into the budget, please, um, the easiest way is just head to our homepage and, and click the budget under top pages. It'll have the connections to everything we talked about, including the engagement page. Um, but falling short of that, if you have questions, feel free to email us, info at amherstma.gov and we'll get you connected to any resource that you need. Thanks, Brianna. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye, Have a nice Mary. day. Have a good weekend.